prayer you will have, how much you read your Bibles. I'm telling you, over the years, that's what I've seen. And I know that uh, we want to be on fire for God, all of us. We read about the church of Laodicea. What did, what did the Lord say to them last week? We read it. I didn't like the spew bit. I didn't like that at all. Spew, spew. No, I don't like spew. That's the Lord. Jesus is speaking this way. And yet we, we scoff at people when they say, you need to get more involved in church. It's the family. It's the family. Just imagine your kids coming up to you and you say, look, you need to come home at night. Your kid's five, five years old. You need to come home at night and be time with family. Oh, I'm not going oh, to. I want to go here. I want to go there. No, no, the family is the solid block. The church is the block. The, the Lord has set up the church. We didn't set it up. It is the only way that he's going to reach the community through the church. Despite all the para churches and everything else, it's still the church that's uh, doing the hard yard. So I encourage you to realise that we need to be living purposefully and all that, as it says up there. It says, um, it says um, what does it say? Not as unwise and witless, we've got to be wise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people, making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity. Can you say time? Oh. I'm, I'm talking about the rest of the year, so I'll say a little bit more about that. I've got five minutes to do it. Because the days are evil. What are they? <laughs> okay. Therefore, do not uh, be vague and thoughtless. Don't be a vagite. You've heard of a troggler. Troglerite, a vagite. A va Don't be a vagite. Know, have a purpose. Know your scripture. Know what God has called you to do. Be on fire for God. That's God wants you to be this way. And it goes on and it says, Therefore do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understand firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. Tell the person next to you, firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's really good. I've got Lenny going. That's great. Okay, lessons we can learn. Next slide. From that scripture. From that, I was going to write it up on the whiteboard. I didn't get time this morning. Okay, number one. Lessons we can learn. Be very careful how we live. You get, that's your choice. You choose. Watch. Be careful how we live. It says in Psalm 39, 4, Show me, O Lord, my life's end. And the number of my days, let me know how fleeting is my life. Sorry, Ray, I said I'm going to live for 140. I'm not going to live for 140. My life is fleeting just like yours. There is a finite time and then I'll fly away, okay? And praise God, it'll be with the Lord. I can't wait. Psalm 90 verse 10, it says, The length of our days is 70 years or 80. If we have the strength, they quickly pass and, and fly away. Quickly pass and fly away. That's our life. Okay, that's why we've got to make sure that we, uh, we're, we're uh, walking on purposefully in life. Now, I suppose, you know, 70, 80 years seems a long time, and I have to be careful what I say, because at one stage, I thought anyone over 40 was an old codger. <laughs> that was when I was young. And those who are young here, which is a few, those at the back, they must really think we're all old codgers. But at the end of the day, you'll be here one day as well. Hope you look as good as me. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, a bit of a joke. We see all these things. You know, time is relevant. It's like when Demi and I used to go out and uh, we first met and we'd sit in the car, we'd talk, okay? We'd sit in the car and talk and she'd look at me and I'd look at her and, uh, you know, it was absolutely incredible. You'd sit there for two and a half hours and it was like 10 minutes. Absolutely. As, uh, you know, I'm looking at Demi like this and she's looking like that to me and I thought, this is fantastic. But, you know, to Demi's mum and dad who were inside, they were waiting for us to come in or me to bring Demi in. And it was like, even though it was 10 minutes, it was like hours. So it's all relative, isn't it? Because they wanted to protect their daughter from me. And so uh, it's all relative. And so you've got to think about that. Um, mums and dads look after their kids, as we know. Praise God. Well, let's look at the next slide. The psalmist also tells us to number our days. And uh, he says there, the psalmist tells us right at the beginning, we read in Ephesians, the word wisdom. Wisdom. You can accumulate all the knowledge. You can know all the scripture. And it can just come out like, you know, the verse and the chapter and the whole bit. But you need wisdom. How do you apply the word that you have inside of you? 
Do you insult people? You're rude? Are you this type of thing? None of you are here because you're clear vision. None of you are rude. But we need to have the wisdom of God. It's a principal thing the Bible talks about. It stands on every street corner and cries out for you to have wisdom. Wisdom of God, which means how you apply the word that you've got inside of you. It's something that's really important. You know, i just give this example. There was a People's Magazine, it's called People's Magazine in America, published an article. It was called Dead Ahead. And it was telling about a new clock they developed. And they sold it for about 100 bucks back in those days. And it used to keep track of how much time you had left to live. And it used to calculate the average um, life. So you put the things into inputs and it come up with your life. Well, I looked on the computer. You can do that for, n for nothing now. You can get the, the software already on there, on the uh, Google it, and this thing comes up a clock. You plug in there, whether you walk, your age now, male or female, and it comes up with your age uh, when you're going to die. Mine's 89, apparently. That's what it says. I don't believe it, of course, but I'm just saying you can do this stuff today, how people love doing all this type of thing. Well, I suppose as we think about what the psalmist says, we know that it's important that our life is fleeting. Now... If I'm going to live until I'm 90 years old, which uh, um, I hope I do, I have about 17 years to go. Or, and I did some calculations. That means 6,205 days. I thought you'd like to hear about all this. I've got 6,205 days left in my life if I live until I'm 90 years old. But wait a minute. I might not have one day. I might walk out there and you're driving down the road and you don't see me and you hit me and you knock me off and that's finished. That's the end of my lifespan. So we've got to be careful. Life is fleeting. The Bible teaches us, um, uh, let's make sure that we're not just living uh, for, um, you know, for various pleasures and that type of thing. I've got here, it says, um, all we have is right now. So our time on this earth is valuable because it is very limited. Can you tell the person next to you, time is limited in your life? So number one, uh, the psalmist has told us to number our days. Number two, if we look at the next slide and wisdom to be in that, we've got to make the most of every opportunity, the most of e every opportunity. And Paul writes about various things we've just uh, read about, and uh, it's important. Now, you know, time, the devil himself wants to take some of our time. And we can be time wasters. We need, we need to make the most of every opportunity, but we can be time wasting. We can waste time sinning. We can be time, waste time in addictions, in affairs, in gossiping, in spreading rumours. And remember in, in John 10.10, 10, as we apply that scripture, Jesus came to give us life to the abundance, to the overflow. The thief, the, the, uh, Jesus, uh, sorry, the devil came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's, tr he, he's come to, as a robber to thieve you of your time. He convinces you and talks to you. It doesn't really matter if you do this or that. It doesn't matter if you do A, B, C. It just, nobody else will see. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if uh, you put in perhaps a quote uh, to somebody and you put cash only and you don't pay the tax, even though everyone's supposed to pay the tax. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Everything matters. And all the people said. Because it consumes us. Remember, Satan is the thief and the robber. There he is. Now, we've got to think about this. We also, if we sin and we get into the habit of sinning, then we start having to worry about the consequences. And Satan will continually remind you. It's not God who has to remind us. We already know when we do the wrong thing. It's Satan who highlights the whole thing. And he wants you to feel condemned. And all the people said. He said, ah, Ray, you're not good enough. See, you couldn't do it this time. You're not going to do it next time. Don't even bother. I know that's not God. That's Satan who wants to convince me it's the wrong thing. Now, let's just look at the next uh, cartoon. I just want to look at this. We've got another five or so minutes. It says, oh, God, I have you penciled in for a quiet time at 6 a.m. If I appear to be sleeping, I am not. I'm praying. And it goes down in, in Psalm 139. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the place of the dead, you are there. And it goes on and so forth. So there he is. Now, it's really important that we get together. I put that up there because we are really promoting prayer. 
and no condemnation, those who can't make it, got to go to work, that's fine, no worries. But if you are free, if you are free, try and come along to some of the morning prayer meetings, it's really great. Because even though um, sometimes if you sit down, you doze off because it's so early, I've learned a technique. The technique I've got is I get up and walk around, all right? So when I walk around, I won't go to sleep, and I can talk to God. Now, I, before Tonya came along, I used to do that anyway, okay? But Tonya does it particularly well. She runs up and down like that really fast, keeps her going, right, as she's seeking God. And uh, we can't keep up with her as she's praying. But we walk up and down and we're seeking God and uh, we're praying and, and uh, asking God. And we know he hears our prayers. And I keep remembering, this is why I keep bringing it up with you guys and me, the two old ladies in Hebrides, 90 plus, one blind, one about over, and they caused revival through their prayers. And I think, Lord, if they can do it, so can I. I said this last week, whenever I spoke last. If they can do it, so can we. Isn't that what should be on the foremost of our minds? We want to see all our rallies saved. We want to see the community starting, instead of cursing God with swear words and having to turn the TV on and every second word is Jesus Christ and it's not nice, Right? It is swearing or the F word or something else, which there seems to be, uh, they love that word for some reason. Um, all that will be changed. Do you know why it will be changed? In, in Wales, and we can look back and see what the Holy Spirit does. In Wales, the jails were empty. Even when the grand final was on, their version of it, nobody went because they wanted to go to church and worship God. We find that there was any crime, uh, uh, hospitals were emptied out, people were being healed. You see, my, it, it talks about uh, the Lord's prayer. His will will be done in heaven, heaven as in earth, as in earth as in heaven. His will here. Well, we don't have to wait for that. We're here to bring the kingdom in. We've got healing, laying hands on the sick and they recover. We should be coming together uh, one with another. When I first got saved, I couldn't wait to get to meetings. And you know what used to happen? I used to be in the Vogue Theatre and Demi and I were downstairs and we'd talking to these folk and they're talking and talking and talking and I heard the music. You know what I'd do? I'd cut this conversation down politely. I'd run up the stairs so I could be in the atmosphere of God. Hear the heavenly choir? See? See what happens when you talk about God? And so I couldn't wait. I'm just trying to explain to you that we need to stir, stir ourselves, stir ourselves. Be purposeful in what you do, in the way you walk, in what you do, because God will reward you openly. Now, I'm just going to have a look at uh, the next uh, scripture, and we might have to finish there. Uh, are you still with me? Yeah. You're all right. The next scripture it's not sin that just makes demands on our time. It can be us doing the right thing. In Luke 10, 40 to 42, it's not a very good colour slide, this one. I won't use it again. And uh, it says uh, in 10, 10, uh, 10, 40, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work myself? Tell her to help me. Now, you know, that's the story of Mary and Martha. And, of course, uh, it was Mary who was sitting at Jesus' feet. Okay. Jesus came in, he wanted to visit Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and uh, he came into the house, and of course uh, Martha was there, she was in the kitchen, and while Jesus was in the lounge, and she was making pavlova and uh, toromadis and all this other Greek food she was making there for the visitors and, uh, and, uh, and this stuff, and there was Mary, she was sitting at Jesus' feet. Now, Martha looked at Mary and thought, how dare she, my sister, how dare she be in there? Uh, Jesus... I'm slaving, and there was perspiration running off her forehead, and she had dishes piled up everywhere, because you know when you do Greek cook cooking, there's a lot of dishes that you need, and she thought, how am I going to do all this? I want to really be there as well. And so she complained. And then Jesus turned around, and he said, Martha, Martha. You know when Jesus uses your name twice, there's big trouble, okay? <laughs> Martha, you've got the wrong attitude. Martha, Martha, he said, Jesus answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. She made a choice. That was a scripture in Ephesians says, we need to walk purposefully. You've got to make the choice. 
Now, the devil and the world want you to make the opposite choice. You're too tired. You can't be blowed. You've been working all day. This is terrible. Oh, blow it. I'm not going to come. I'm going to stay home. Besides, you know, I don't get that much out of meetings. I never learn anything when Ray preaches. It can be all sorts of stuff that we go through. But it's the devil who reinforces that and puts those things in your mind. And if you agree with him, it comes to pass. You'll never learn anything, I say. You'll think, Ray's talking again. I'm not coming. Okay? Be careful of attitude. That's how it works. The devil is on your number. He knows what buttons to push in your life. Absolutely. And we've got to make sure that he doesn't. So we see Martha there, and she was getting very upset, and Jesus had to speak to her. Now, Martha was not committing sin by doing the cooking and doing all this type of thing, but you know her problem was? Her problem was in the next slide. Have a look. Her problem was, you got it? She was so preoccupied with what she was doing. That can be us. So preoccupied, but mustn't point. Mustn't look at anyone. I look at everyone to make sure I'm not picking any, anyone, right? <laughs> it says, she was so preoccupied with what she was doing that she didn't realise that God was in the living room. Wow. You want to think about that? God is in her living room and she's so preoccupied with the Greek food and the tour mothers and this and that and something else and some mothers do have them and all the rest of it. She's preoccupied with everything that's going on around except the king is in a living room. Well, we're in the New Testament. The king is living in you, the living room. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. And when we get together, it's not just getting it together. This isn't a clear vision, there's nothing. When we get together, there is a force that comes together. It's called the force of fellowship, the force of coming together with prayer. God honours that and comes in the midst of it. Where are two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm in the midst. The Bible says, don't forsake, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's the teaching from the scripture. And I still hear from people, oh, we don't need to come to church. That's all right. Come on, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted, so praise God. Thank you that you're here today. I well, thank you that you're listening to me and uh, that you uh, are not pulling faces as I'm speaking. All right. So all this thing, we can be caught up in the here and now and fail to deal with the eternal that God has placed in your heart. Eternity is in your heart. There's this medical guy. I promise I'll only speak for another five minutes. Bronwyn, all right, you hold me to that. Five minutes, all right, only five minutes, I'm looking at the clock. All right, his name was Richard Swenson, a medical doctor, and he wrote a book in which he discusses one of, one of the major sicknesses of our time. Guess what that is? You know that already. Huh? Anxiety. Anxiety and stress. And he calls it overload. He says that's our whole community. People are just plain overloaded. Let's have a look. What are we overloaded with? I've only got five minutes. Quickly change the slides or I'll blame you for keep keeping back. All right. Yeah, we're overloaded with commitments. We commit to this, we commit to that, we commit to something else, and we commit to so many time, so many things, family events, whatever it may be, we ain't got time to come to church anymore. All those people that we see every morning with their kids, they're committed to take them to play soccer, cricket, all the rest of it. There's nothing wrong with sport, but those kids used to come to Sunday school at one stage. They don't now because Sunday school is on the time when they're out there playing sport. And we know that we've brought up a generation who don't know Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's because it's our fault, the baby boomers' fault. We didn't scream and shout long enough to make sure these things didn't happen. Commitments. We're overloaded the area of work. I had blokes. I was a project manager in London. I, had, I used to work the exact hours and a little bit more. I had project managers who worked 15 hours a day. 15 hours a day five days a week, and then the, the, the uh, people tried to get us to work extra hours on weekends, which I refused to do, but they would work extra hours for extra pay. You can't live your life for work. You've got to put boundaries around it, and all the people said, boundaries around what you do for work. You've got to go the extra mile, but not the extra mile and the extra mile, because that will kill you, and you won't have time to do what you need to do. Whoa, blackness comes upon the screen and it's flicking around. Um, there is information overload. Information overload. It's causing problems in our lives. Is it flashing before your eyes? <laughs> information does that. It flashes before your eyes and you don't read it. There's so much of it that comes in over the internet nowadays. So we're overloaded with all this stuff and it's a real problem. 
Well, I was going to say all sorts of things, and I'll just finish with a few things. I could go on and on, as you're hearing me do, on and on and on. You know, um, we've got 39 weeks and six days left in this year. That's 279 days. That's 6,696 hours. That's 401,760 minutes we've got. And we've got to record the time. Do you realise that 21.9% of this year is already gone? I ask you, what have you done with this year in your life? What have you done? Huh? Ask yourself, what have you done in, during this 21.9% of the year we've already used? I ask myself, I look at it and think, I've done hardly anything. <laughs> Praise God. I've lived, I've worked, I've done stuff, I've met with the kids. How many people have spoken about God? Well, a few, but I could speak to a few more. It's really important. And uh, what have we got up there? It says, so what are we to do? Well, what are we to do? Let's click it once more and have a look. Just once more. There is. Thanks, thanks, Ron, for that. Understand what the Lord's will is. Understand what the will, Lord's will is. We can be so saturated with this life, going in, going out, and all this type of stuff. We get saturated with worries and anxieties and all this type of thing. It's important that you realise you've got to do what God wills you to do. And I've got a whole list of things here that I want to go through, which I won't because we've run out of time. But I'll just read this one story, if I can find it, and then I'll, uh, we'll just finish and I'll perhaps continue on stage two of this. And uh, uh, just, uh, okay, the story. A lot of people live in um, a situation where they say, I wish that I could. And uh, I wish if I could, um, you know, go on holidays. I wish I didn't have to go to school. I know when I went to school, I think, I can't wait until the day's over because I, I hate school. We say, I, I can't wait until my job's over because I'll be home. And it's always like this. And there's a story about uh, a lady. And, uh, uh, and she told herself, if I can ever get out of college and get married and have children, I know I'll finally... Um, um, be able to enjoy my life. So she stuck with it. She went to classes every day, just like Mercy and uh, Eunice and, uh, and William, stuck to it every day. And then she got married and had children and discovered that children had a lot of work. They were a lot of work. So she told herself, if I can get the, these kids raised, then I'll ta be able to, ta able to relax and enjoy life. Is that annoying you too much? I'll use the other microphone. Is that all right? All right. About that time, the kids were entering into high school. The husband said, guess what? We don't have enough money so that you're going to have to go out to work to support them in college. Well, she didn't want to, but she knew he was right and they needed, uh, they needed the money. So she went to work and she hated it. But she told herself, if I can just get these kids out of college and get all the bills paid, then I can quit work and really enjoy life. Finally, the last child graduated from college. Woohoo! I'm free, she said. And all the bills were paid. So she walked into her employer's office and he said, and she said, I quit. He says, Oh, what? You're gonna quit? Don't, don't quit now. If you stay with us another eight years, you'll have a pension for the rest of your life. So she looked at that and she thought, yeah, well, there's still stuff I've got to pay for and, and, and various other things. Well, I, I don't want to work another eight years, but there's all that money there and I really can't turn down the opportunity. So she worked for another eight years. Finally, she got her husband and her retired at the same time. They sold their home and bought a little retirement cottage. Then they sat down on the swing on the front porch and looked at the family pictures and albums and dreamed about the good old days. Their only enjoyment was waiting for the letterbox, the postman to come and put letters in the box so they could open up. Oh, this is thrilling, more advertising. Okay. You know, uh, just put the next slide up. I think it might come up. It's um, a slide. It should. Okay, it says this. This is the saying. Now listen to this. Listen to this, Eunice and Mercy, as you're studying. Listen to this, William. Listen to this, Dennis. And everyone, including Ray and Paul, it says this, life is what happens to you while you're making plans to do something else. Life is what happens to you 
while you're making plans to do something else. So I want to conclude on this. We need to be purposefully involved in our life preaching the gospel. But why don't we enjoy it? Which means you have to cut down on some of your working hours. You have to cut down on some of the things you're doing. Start enjoying life. God wants you to enjoy life. And perhaps then your relatives, friends and others, when they see a change in your circumstance, they'll think, wow, I want a piece of that. Praise God. I could just encourage you to stand, all right? <laughs> Let's give the Lord a clap. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I enjoyed giving that talk. I enjoyed delving into the scriptures and seeing what the Lord wants us to do. Is there someone here who's got a headache at the moment? Someone got a headache that they want to get rid of, because if you do. The other thing is there's someone here.